Thank you uh, as well to our partners, SAGE and Pride Center of Edmonton. Before I introduce the speaker, I wish to acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 uh, territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of uh, Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our community. Further, I should let you know that this session uh, is being recorded for future use on our YouTube channel. If you don't wish your image to be recorded, please close your, uh, your video link. Our, our speaker today is Michael Fair. Michael is well known to all of you, and uh, I am not going to uh, attempt to list all of his achievements, which incidentally include uh, uh, with the late Sherry McKibben, the founding of Evelyn Pride Seniors Group, which is the, the parent of Aging with Pride. Rather, I think I can best summarize the breadth of Michael's work by saying that it has been truly transformative. Not only is the Edmonton queer community better and stronger for his efforts, the entire city has been enriched by him. Michael's topic uh, today is Edmonton Queer Spaces. So over to you, Michael. And um, thank you. And I'm going to uh, thank you, Larry, very much. And I'm going to um, share my screen uh, because I have everything I want to say on the screen. And you should be seeing the screen now. Yes. Yes. And uh, oops. all right. So thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to be here today um, with all of you and uh, to have a chance to talk a little bit about queer spaces. And, and I'm going to go through initially just a little bit of what I'm going to try to accomplish. Then we'll actually look at some spaces. Eh, we'll look at them online, of course, but whatever. And that we'll get as close as we can. Oops. Um, so um, if you're interested in contacting me, that's it. And much of what I talk about will is also contained within the Edmonton Queer History Project. Uh, which the website is there. Uh, and that has uh, a lot more than, than we'll be talking about today. And I'll talk more about it, uh, about the, 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 uh, the project um, as we go a little bit further. But I, I just wanted to kind of start um, uh, with that. So th this next slide is a little bit of the goals of, of um, uh, this project and how I got involved. Um, and it, it, to bring us backwards a bit, in, in uh, the early 2000s at the University of Alberta, primarily through the Institute of Sexual Minorities and, and Services, which uh, Chris Wells was involved in there, there was the beginnings of a history project that was done. Uh, and, and that project, when that was uh, undertaken, um, it, it was an opportunity for at the university for, for Chris and other people to begin to put together some pieces of, of history, some of it around events. Uh, they, they also looked for, for written information that was available. They also did a number of videos uh, and interviews uh, with people that had been involved along the way. Uh, and, and that presentation took place, uh, an official public presentation took place at the Alberta uh, uh, Art Gallery in, uh, during Pride in, I think it was uh, 2016, but I won't swear to the, which year that was, and that my memory fails. And that's what happens when the gray stuff comes in, you know, kind of the, it, it kind of fails. It might have been a little bit before that. Um, more recently, uh, just before the pandemic actually started, um, quite just uh, really just a couple of months before, there was a small group of us um, that, that got together. I think three of us actually, <laughs> or four maybe, um, uh, over a coffee. Um, and, and one of the persons, um, uh, Jason, uh, was the one who kind of pulled it together with an idea about doing some kind of event 
during uh, Pride. Now, uh, 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 for for the community, not during Pride. This was after the the Pride Parade has decided it wasn't going to happen, and et cetera, et cetera. And and talked about another kind of of um, a public act, just an act, a one off kind of event and not during pro- what would have been the tr- pride week some other time altogether so that it that it wasn't an attempt to try to uh, pretend it was uh, um you know t- taking on a pride parade in any fashion at all anyway in that discussion <clears throat> i had very recently gotten from um a joe cc who is a member of the legislature from calgary who's a friend of mine uh, at my place came to my place to, for dinner i think um and he gave me he, he threw at me a map from calgary that was called the gay calgary map kind of thing in that um uh, which i looked at and and uh had some things about it were good and so at this small meeting i brought up that, that if we did uh, some kind of event, we should also do something historical and we should create a map. And I said, we could do better than Calgary's, which is pretty minimal in my opinion. Um, I can say that because no one from Calgary's here, <laughs> I think today. Um, so uh, so <clears throat> we, we, um, we started to, to, to move forward, both with kind of an event in which this, map we were thinking about would be part of that and and some some tours with it as it turned out um it wasn't long before we were in the in um uh, the, the, the pandemic and and any outdoor event was was gone um but at as we met again and brought uh, chris wells in from McEwen, um the notion of the map took flight kind of thing in that um, and we, in Edmonton, there had been bus tours, uh, held during a number of years of pride, uh, that Darren Hagen used to run and he helped organize as well that went around looking at different places, which people, a number of people came over the years, took those bus tours. I was on them with him most of the time. And those seemed to be, to work kind of well and, and did bring forward a fair bit of history. Um, at the same time. So we decided that um, at, at that time, uh, Chris said that he could take over uh, working with Darren, he could bring some other support of, of students that he had as well, and we could begin to, to look at it. Um, I pushed hard that we wanted the map to look professional and really nice and all that kind of good junk kind of thing in that. So we also went out looking for um, uh, a designer uh, who would be able to do that, take our ideas and put it into a map, which which really um, is what is the Edmonton uh, project, uh, history project, and the map that we've designed really has, has come out <clears throat> from that very initial work. Um, and so just to emphasize, the, the goals of that walking map were, we wanted it to be a quality map, um, Chris at McEwen uh, built up a team um, that included a number of, of, of people, not just Darren, but um, uh, the, the fellow who runs um, uh, Evolution, um, uh, and then a couple of other um, uh, PhD students that he had that were, were interested in, in, uh, in, in, in queer history. Um, and they began building the information that that has uh, become part of, of the map and and the website, um, and and we we wanted to, to identify real places and real stories, and ensuring that the last fifty years in Edmonton were not lost. Um, so so uh, both what we could find in the in records or in magazines or uh, on Facebook, but also interviewing uh, individuals and talking with people who had firsthand knowledge or been involved, depending what it was. Um, uh, and so there there were personal stories and and interviews and and items that were written and put together and they're all part of of uh, uh that website now um which is 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 quite extensive so the other points i'd make today is, is that some of of what 
um, it, it, it is part of looking backwards. It's, it's formal in terms of, uh, we talk about a place like Gate, whatever, and you can find records, et cetera. But a lot of it is informal as well. It's it's what people know or experienced. And that's always more difficult to, to capture. Um, and I'll mention a little bit about that as we move a, a little further today uh, about being able to capture um, or the importance of the informal, how it really builds the context around uh, what was going on. Um, the, we also, um, in, in designing this project, um, it, it's all electronically online. It can be added to, which is one of the benefits of having um, uh, the the, um, the whole uh, virtual world these days. Is that that it's relatively easy to add, and we've already added things that are not on the map, kind of thing, in that because of information that's come forward or people that have brought forward, kind of thing as well. It was also the intention so that it could be visited by anyone, not. The, you know, anyone who is gay or lesbian or anybody else in the public could um, uh, use the map or do it electronically as well. Um, and, and the map allowed anyone to walk in that. Now, we've done a number of walks that we've organized kind of, but anybody can do it on their own with the map. They don't need to have uh, uh, anyone actually take the lead on it, but we've done some of, of those as well. So we wanted to make sure so that it, as many people as possible um, could look at our, our, our uh, um, background. Um, we also aim to capture some of the context of the times, what was going on that led to some of what we, we were happening. And I think that's an area that we've done not too badly. I think that's the context is always much more difficult to capture because it ends up being talking heads like you're getting today and that's nowhere near as fun or it's interesting kind of thing in that. Uh, so with that, this talking head, we'll move to the next one. So I'll talk about um, uh, one of the very first um, organizations involved um, with gay and lesbian, which was GATE. Um, uh, and um, th this um, GATE was, was founded by Michael Roberts in 1971. Um, in connection, actually, he was at the University of Alberta, along with a couple other fellows or persons. Um, and they ran kind of an informal group uh, at one of the, I think uh, one of the houses that are right near the university that that a couple of them lived in, um, and that uh, uh, Michael specifically had been in Vancouver, which which had a gate, which gay alliance towards everyone, uh, is what the letters stand for, and so he suggested that name, which incidentally ended up in Halifax as well and a number of other cities. It came. It's just interesting how that term gate uh, spread through other to other places, kind of thing. That too. Um, uh, it, we should. I should mention that before 1971, there were certainly things that were going on, um, specifically uh, at some of the hotels downtown. The big ones had bars that people, gay and lesbian members, uh, well, gay men in one part and women in another part. They, they were separated uh, by sex in those days, uh, most of them. Um, it, usually in the back lounge, kind of by themselves um, and on you know Friday or Saturday evenings, informally. They were not there officially. Um, bartenders certainly knew what was going on. And, and as long as no one caused any issue, they just kind of let them there because they were there drinking and, and paying money, you know, with money as well and that that's what bars are all about is making money really kind of thing in that as well um however gate was the first attempt at an organization as such um and michael was part of making that happen um there were house parties also that were taking place and that's the informal stuff that's much harder to get to um uh, I remember a, a couple of, of women on the south side, um, south of White Avenue, but but closer to uh, Bonnie Doon um, in that area, who who told me about house parties that they had for for women, and that were that the police had to come a couple times because it's 
the noise the racket or whatever was was being uh, happening um and that uh uh, it, it, women just some women I just came because they knew about it. They heard about it. You know, it was all informal. There was nothing formal about it. Um, and and I'm not sure, you know, how often some of these happened. On the north side, um, there was a a, um, a place in actually in the high rise um, right near the, uh, um, uh, the the right near the hospital off of 101st um, an apartment that a couple of fellows were in and they had um, uh, parties quite often uh, is my understanding um, again informally and again raided by the police on a number of occasions because there was quite a bit of racket and a fair bit of alcohol around all over the place i think um and and they uh, eventually those ended but but those kind of led to folks starting to say you know we, we need something a little bit more than you know informal parties that are just you know they're fine but but that isn't is that all there is so gate and starting as they did, um, it, it shortly about 72 or 73, moved into uh, um, a space in the down, uh, in on the south side, on the 109th kind of thing for a bit. And, and then um, in about uh, 19, uh, I think 68 or nine, they moved across the river and this is their first office. You can see the word gate in the window on the second floor of the Benson's building kind of thing in that. Um, and uh, gate played an extremely important role um, as a, a kind of a, today we would say kind of a social service organization. Um, they had a library, they provided some counseling, they provided a place for, for people to drop in. Um, they were open primarily in the evenings uh, and uh, they, they had they developed some some training, so to speak, so that that um, there were usually hosts there who had been just trained a little bit to welcome people. And then the people who did some counseling had some um, um, uh, some background in it and, and also some training um, that they would do. Um, they soon outgrew that space and moved to um this building which did not look like this at this time but was called the phillips lofts um it was it moved into a space on the first floor the this building was essentially empty with the exception that the only other um uh entity in here was a a, um, a place that had that that stored furs and i'm talking about furs that women wore that was you know where they put them in there for the winter or the, I'm sorry, for the summer, sorry. They would cook them out for the winter kind of thing in that. Um, and I think that, that from my best understanding is they, they would take that from any number of women and, and, and um, stores, uh, certainly some, a few of the stores that sold furs in those days, uh, what they had left over, they would bring here to be, to stay during the summer and then they'd be, come and take them back. But so it wasn't an active place. It wasn't like there were people going in and out of there at all. The only people going in and out were those of us going to Gate. Um, Gate flourished at that time, became uh, uh, probably the most significant uh, organization in the city. Um, had a had a, a significant number of volunteers that did all of the kinds of things I've said. Um, they had an organization where they they had a board um, that they oversaw what was happening. They also, because they got no funding from anywhere, they then had to raise money, which they did primarily through dances. Um, they did a few other kinds of things, but it was mainly dances and they would hold them at different um, places in the city. I, I remember going to um, a couple of places further up north near Chinatown. Um, uh, they, they, I can't even remember the names that they, they were, um, they were like community halls. They weren't by, but by a different association that halls that could be rented, kind of thing in that. And and the dances would be held there, um, and uh, would be open to anyone that that wanted to come to them. And they would be advertised by um, uh, Gate and other 
organizations that might be around at that time, eventually through the bars that they that started to come about as well. Um, uh, and so uh, I think that during the um, the period of the into the late 70s and 80s, Gate was probably the most significant uh, gay lesbian organization in the town, other than the court. But Gate, um, I, I think that many young people that came to Edmonton at that time found their way to Gate. It was the, it was the only one that was kind of there and around that people knew something about. And so many people walked in um, wanting to know where things were. Um, a lot of the counseling was about what it was like to be gay and lesbian. And people were, young people were still dealing with that. Um, it was close to the Greyhound station. A lot of them came by Greyhound. Darren Hagen being one of them, kind of thing in that. Um, but but many others uh, uh, came that way. Um, many from the rural areas. There's always been a significant influx of uh, queer people from smaller parts of Alberta ending up in Edmonton, kind of thing in that. And so, Gate played a really pivotal role, I think, in in um, working with and ass assisting. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of people as they as they came to Edmonton, um, and and I think that that was part of it. But as I said, they were also involved in other things. Um, this was their Halloween dance that they sponsored, um, and it, this is probably about eighty four five something like that. I'm not quite sure uh, of the 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 photo didn't have a date on. Um, I recognize a number of people there, although I can't tell you the names. I don't think of anybody, partly because some of the costumes hide quite a bit. Um, some of the rest of you might recognize uh, some of the ones there. Uh, it's also <coughs> interesting um, in the informal uh, part a bit because the costumes they're wearing are of a certain era as well. And those of you who are older will recognize some of this kind of thing. The the and the, the group of four that are the woman with the two there, the two guys in the in the helmets and the uniform a bit, um, um, the space head and the one God Almighty, some of the stuff that they're wearing kind of thing. And that is, you know, it, it depicts a certain time uh, as well. Um, I can't imagine going to a Halloween party looking like this, anybody looking like this these days kind of thing in that too. And, and the one I remember going to myself, um, uh, I, I dressed it as um, uh, um, Billy, uh, it was a Billy Clobber, who was a character on CBC radio, who who, who was a, supposedly a hockey uh, guy who was, you know, completely off. But I but I wore shoulder pads. I also wore skates and I wore stuff over my head so that people actually didn't recognize me initially, nor did they figure out what character I was either. I mean, really, but anyway, I remember doing that um, and going to to uh, the Halloween party. Uh, the other memory that that I would share, and again, this is you know, this is all informal. This is the kind of thing that that you know help give a better sense of the context. Um, because this was all volunteer run, um, it was all set up by volunteers. Um, Gate had to get a, a liquor permit, um, and then we had to go to the liquor store to order the liquor, and then we had to pick it up, and then take it here. And then we had to have people who were registered or whatever the term was that could then, you know, sell it, pour it, et cetera, and that, and to, et cetera. And then at the end of the evening, of course, we had to clean up. And um, my roommate at the time, John Brock, who was a part of Gate, right, from very early on, um, and I um, usually were part of the cleanup, and we usually took the liquor that was left and the empties yeah, because we had to return all that as well, kind of thing in that. And so one of the nights that we did that um, during the summer, um, uh, by the time things were done and cleaned up and we were packing all of the stuff in my car, kind of thing that it was probably 3.30 or 4 in the morning, kind of thing in that. And it was it was light. It was midsummer. Um, and as we were driving back to my place with all this liquor, both filled and opened kind of thing in that and empty and that uh, at one of the stoplights that a police car rolled alongside of us and, and john saw it first he said 
I don't want to tell you, but there's a police car right next to us. And I'm like, oh my God. Um, however, we got through the lights. We got home safe and sound, took everything inside my place for the night. And the next day, put it all back in my car and took it all back. I mean, that was part of being a volunteer and doing these kinds of things. And I think that's part of the context that sometimes we miss, uh, not miss, but, but we kind of forget how all that was done by people as volunteers um, through those years. So, so that was one, that, but the gate, Gates survived on dances in those days. That's where they made their major, major money. So the next one I want to spend just a bit of a moment uh, on is um, uh, Club 70, which was the first uh, gay lesbian bar in town. And it um, was founded by a nonprofit group made up of gays and lesbians, um, a society uh, with a board. Um, and they rented space in this building, in the basement, um, uh, where you see the two men walking, that's actually 109th Street. It was around the corner. Uh, oh, no, no, am I wrong? Anyway, it was in the basement here somewhere. That's a, a room in the basement. Um, and and, and uh, Miller, uh, Miller Pub uh, was there. Um, and you see the, the, what the building used to look like. It's torn down now. And that was 1969. Um, and many know the story that rather than call themselves Club 69, because of the what that might connote, they called the club 70 because it was close to the end of the year. And they didn't want to use the term 69 for obvious reasons. So um, uh, and, and they were only open on weekends. Um, you had to uh, be notified whether it would be open because it besides volunteers, they had to get a liquor license every week, the kind of thing, every time they wanted to be open. Uh, in that. And so some on occasion, they weren't able to get a liquor license either because it was too slow or they come, whatever would happen. So you had to get, you got a phone call to tell you that it was going to be open. And there were a number of people who, who had partial you know, numbers to call to let them know. Um, and interestingly, I, I've seen that list. It's now in the city of Edmonton archives and it has like, like nearly 300 names on it and phone numbers. But when I was shown it by one of the people involved at that time, went through a number of names and said, well, oh, that's not their real name. They didn't use that in the real name, but the phone number was correct because people didn't want to be known by their real name. So they, they, um, they changed their, uh, their name, but they had the right phone number because that's the only way they knew. So it was only there for a couple of months and the owner found out who this group was and then locked them out. Um, and so midnight, uh, one night, a uh, pickup truck and a couple of the fellows um, came, actually, I think, the, yes, it came and broke in the door and took out most of the stuff that belonged to them. Um, and then they, they, they eventually went to and, and got their deposit back. They went to court, and got their deposit back the kind of thing that as well. So that building was just torn down two years ago. Um, and it's on the corner of 109th and 106th. Uh, and that um, that was short lived. Um, and so um, this is the inside. This is a photo from inside where uh, Club 70 was. Uh, and these two people dancing are Doug Wilson in the striped shirt and part, uh, Pat Fortier in the white shirt. Um, um, and that's what the place inside looked like. You can't see there was a little place where the bar was set up and then the the, uh, the phonograph and records, vinyl records were over in another corner kind of thing in that. And I think you can't see behind um, the guy in the pad in the white shirt, I think is kind of a speaker um, that's in that corner kind of thing that as well. Um, it's also interesting because Pat Fortier eventually ended up owning and running uh, Boots and Saddles, which was an outgrowth of Club 70 many years later, kind of thing that also of interest is that that the, that the society, um, uh, uh, well, actually, I'll move on to that one. The society, and I know you can't really read this, but this is the minutes from, from just after their opening meeting and the rules they had um, and, and the upcoming election they were going to have. And the, the second chairperson, uh, when it um, became Club 70 or, or when it moved, uh, was a woman who was actually the chair for the next couple of years kind of thing, because this was clearly involved, it clearly involved uh, men and women. And interesting, when you look at who was elected, it just has the first initial of each name and then the last name. So 
um, it takes a bit of sleuthing to figure out whether we're women or men kind of thing in that. Um, one of the other board members was Dow Hicks, which I, I was amazed at. I didn't realize that's who it was kind of thing in that, um, who went on to found uh, uh, the Roost eventually. Uh, that. And I never realized he'd been involved in, in this way back in the early days. And so we have that information is interesting, what the board was looking at, the rules they thought they had to make for the club, who could get in. Um, it's just fascinating to read what, what the context of those times was, what that meant. So here's where they moved to. And, be, and um, Club 70 was here in this building, which is now Latitude 53 um, on 106 uh, between 100 and 2nd and uh, 102nd and 103rd kind of thing in that on, on the east, uh, west side of the block. Um, and and well, Club 70 lasted till about 1976, 77. And, and at that time, uh, uh, you had the club became a private club owner and the roost was also uh, in existence by that point as well as another private club. Uh, and and um, um, uh, that the, um, oh, the, the other one right across the street from the roost, um, um, Oh, so I forget the name at the moment. It's quasi, it was almost it was uh, getting ready to open as well. Uh, yes, yes, right. And so, thanks. So, so, but but Boots and Saddles stayed open in, until the early two thousands. Um, it it um, it had a, a different name initially, and then became Boots and Saddles for the longest period of time. And then it changed its, its name at, towards the end, uh, the last few years, because it it went. It, it closed and then it was it was taken over by a couple of women uh, who ran it for the last couple of years before it disappeared entirely. Um, and it has a, a long history. Uh, one of the interesting parts is, is that on the roof, which you can't see here, um, there was a bit of a uh, balcony, not a balcony, but a garden up there and, and a space that they put out some chairs in there. I'm sure it was completely illegal. Um, the, the, the little walk space on the, on the stairs to get there would, would have been impossible for almost anyone in a wheelchair. Anybody had a that, that had difficulty, and they would carry a booze up there. And I'm sure that was illegal. Um, and it would be outside there on nights that were warm, kind of thing. And that, and you could hear some of the noise going on, kind of thing. And that, if you were careful. But but I I. I, I Having been a member of city council, I know that would have never been approved kind of thing that that no one knew that the city had no inclination. It was never on any development permit or whatever. They just did it kind of thing in that as well. Uh, there were a lot of drag queen uh, events here as well at, at um, uh, Boots and Saddles. Um, uh, that so. Um, then I'm going to go on to, to Edmonton Queer Space, which is a little different kind of space. It's not a queer space as such, like the clubs were, um, because we're really talking about City Hall. And we are in, in, in thinking about this. Um, primarily, we're, we're getting into um, uh, uh, the, the end of the 80s and into the 90s kind of thing that uh, uh, was going on. Um, because through Gate and then through Gala, which was around at that point, um, there were attempts to have, and or there were Pride Weeks that took place. And there were um, uh, letters sent to the city hall, to the mayor and council to proclaim Pride. Um, and that was turned down by uh, early mayors and members of council. And a number of them making, you know, the kind of quotes that, um, you know, were awful kind of thing. You know, one of them said something about, you know, they never happened here. I'd moved to Australia. So we did a little thing about, we hope they did. There were lots of sheep there. He'd be just fine kind of thing in that. Um, other other little things like that that we did. Um, but but it, it was refused uh, as such um, it, until um, 1993. Um I think I've got my yeah. when uh, Mayor Reimer was the mayor, um, and uh, she um, did do a, a thing about uh, about gay uh, in in the city as part of the um, at that time the Pride Week had a, a, a booklet 
that 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 it was given out uh, at the different events and also if you filled in there was some prize you could get it at the end or something i can't remember exactly that as well but she provided a letter on behalf of the city um to the uh, pride uh to that and that was one of the first times that there was an official recognition from the city um in 93 and 94, there was a proclamation from the mayor by Reimer, Jan Reimer. Um, in 90, uh, I'm wrong on that. The years are a little bit earlier. Um, in, in um, sorry, in, in, in 1989 and 1990, um, uh, Jan proclaimed it. In 19, and, uh, then a little later, and then uh, then further on, yes, and then in 1993, um, uh, Jan was on holidays, and the acting mayor was Sheila McKay, and she would not issue it, and, and that, so so we did not get one. The next year when Jan was back, we did again, and then we've gotten proclamations uh, for a number of years after that. I was on the city council at that time, um, and was always always did some work with her office in between that time uh, or, or about the proclamation. But that was one of the first things that finally happened at the city. One of the other big things that happened um, that, that those of you who were involved would remember is that um, in Edmonton, there had, uh, sorry, in, in Canada, there was the growth of choruses, uh, of, of gay lesbian choruses. And in Edmonton, the Edmonton vocal minority was the gay chorus in town in Edmonton, both men and women. Um, and there was a national organization um, that every two years, I think, held a festival a kind of thing. And that of course is coming across from across the country. There would be workshops and then they do a number of concerts, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, uh, the local group sponsored it in 1998 with the major events taking place at City Hall. And that was the first time that many of us are aware of where there were a gay, specifically gay lesbian events that took place at City Hall, um, like other groups have done ever since the new City Hall was built. Um, and um, it, uh, it was unique in that groups that came from other cities and, and you know Vancouver and Toronto and Halifax and um, uh, Saskatoon, um, Hamilton, I can't remember that, that I think there were about 14 or 15 cities that were here. None of them could have believed that we could do this would be done in City Hall and it, and it was approved and recognized. And so um, there were things that and the final concert always was where the, all of the groups would do some stuff together. And that was open to the public. Anyone could come kind of thing in that. And there were a couple hundred people in the audience kind of thing in that. Um, and it was a, a huge success kind of thing in that. And partly because the setting of, of uh, uh, not only, you know, singing as people wanted to do and having a good time with the other people, et cetera, and that, but also the setting that it was in. Um, most of you have been in City Hall, so you know that that main room, you know, is filled with sunlight and light. It's, uh, um, it's a really lovely space to be in. And I think if that combined that it was the City Hall, um, and we read a proclamation, and I think I read the proclamation at that, uh, at that time, uh, uh, for that. So that was 1998 um, that took place. Um, also connected with City Hall, and this is Mayor Mandel way over on the right. Oh, and I'm in there too somewhere. Um, and so so is um, uh, a, a few other folks that probably some of you would um, uh, would know um, as well. Because this would have been, um, this was the first um, uh, Pride um, uh, um, the fire camp firefly uh, mayor's breakfast brunch I guess or breakfast whatever we called the brunch I think I don't know breakfast back then this was the very first one and it was done when Mayor Mandel agreed to do it and announce it um, uh, and and it, again it was the uh, institute of sexual minority studies and services and chris wells and others there who were behind this and they had met with me um and uh, chris and myself and i think somebody else went to meet with mandel about about 
uh, possibly interested in something like this. And, and he agreed to, to be the sponsor of the very first one. Um, and my memory is that we held it at the Legion uh, on 112th, at the corner of 112th and 83rd, um, that the Legion Hall. Uh, we had, a, 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 I think that's where we held it. I may be wrong at the location kind of thing, but these were some of the people that helped to organize and to run it, that volunteers, um, a couple of people, yeah, well, the mayor and, and a couple of us who were political were you know, kind of volunteers, but the others did the work, so to speak, and that too. And But that was, you know, an official, um, a function of the mayor of the city of Edmonton kind of thing. I took it to another level, in my opinion, altogether um, that was there. Um, one of the other informal things that I wanted to mention as I'm moving along fairly quickly uh, that, that doesn't get recognized and, and that are, and it's the kind of thing that's tough to do is when I was at city council, I had a couple of people who worked, who were employees of the city that were gay meeting with me saying that they were concerned, they wanted to have uh, uh, same sex benefits for their spouse or their partner as, as, as others uh, under that. So, uh, which I knew nothing about, which I went about finding. And then what was told um, it was that the, the city could not, did, would not implement that. That was part of bargaining negotiations. The unions had to apply for it uh, as part of the bargaining. And so went back to these fellows and said, you know, you have to get something going on within your unions to bring it forward, which they did with some others. Um, it came forward that next year as part of the bargaining uh, between the city and, and administration and them. And what, it, what came to city council was that it was the, the, the administration was recommending that it be adopted as part of the bargaining uh, about, the, about the new uh, uh, for the next year. Um, and they indicated it was practically no cost and council, all of council approved that as part of the, the agreement and that. So the city of Edmonton had benefits for same-sex partners probably before almost any other entity in the city kind of thing in that um it was it was um uh it was quite it was it was quite an occasion but it's one of those little things that 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 isn't documented kind of anywhere and, and you know, all this negotiating was in private of course and nothing and same with council this meeting the meeting when council approves it, uh uh the 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 um uh, the union negotiations is all in private. So nothing gets recorded kind of in that regard either. So it, it'll probably, no one will know. Once a couple of us are gone, <laughs> no one will know. So that's that's when we talk about some of the private stuff that, that, that we don't always know. So moving along fairly quickly, um, oops, I, we're on to finally um, some uh, comments or questions. Um, I'm particularly interested um, any questions you have or whether you've got some things you might be able to share that you recall thinking back over the last 50 years. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you uh, so much, Michael. Uh, either the electronic symbol or simply raise your hand if people do have questions. Uh, Jan, you're muted, but. I just had a comment on the Club 70 and the picture that you had of the two men dancing. And I thought that for a gay um, uh, party, there was way too much lighting and there was very little decorations on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Jan, and I suspect that was a, a picture taken purposely so people could see what the place looked like. <laughs> I, I was here, if I may make a comment, I was here for the early part. I sort of came out in 67, uh, uh, 68, and what I remember is how nearly impossible it was to find any information about where where gay men went and so on, and my 
the way in which I found some of these very hidden places, uh, I've told you, but I'm not sure I've told the others. I happened to be on a bar, and I was a student at that point, in a bar on White Avenue, and I went to the, the men's room, and someone had written there on uh, the wall, where do the fags go in Edmonton? And lo and behold, someone had answered it. I was into the Royal George, which was one of those uh, uh, very hidden, but nearly gay bars uh, the next night and never looked back. But I uh, just, the, the importance of getting information out and so on and all of this stuff really is, will be lost unless uh, projects like the, uh, the Edmonton Pride History uh, Group. Good, thanks. Joan, you had your hand up, I saw. Uh, yeah, I first came out in Red Deer, and there was this association called GARD, Gay and ah, yes. Lesbian yes. Association Red Deer, and they often spoke of GATE. GATE was who we, you know, we said, look, it's possible to do what we're doing, because somebody in the group had, had dealings with GATE in Edmonton, so they were kind of our mentor in a way, and uh I remember eventually getting to the city and just, you know, going and I think Gate had a newsletter out for a while. Yeah. I remember picking it up in bookstores and whatnot and just, it was like a beacon, you know, but uh, they set a really nice uh, path for so many people afterwards, you know, and it just went on from there. But the fear and the excitement, oh my God, I don't know if I could ever match that anymore. <laughs> Now it's just also blasé, you know. I wonder about that now. But and, and I do remember guard as well. And thanks for bringing that up, um, because I was and some of others. There, there was an attempt, and there was a kind of a provincial organization for a while. And I was involved with that a little bit as well. And and knew about guard. And I think came to some event or some meeting in Red Deer. Uh, that guard was hosting, and I think it was with some of the others, like Calgary and, and you know that kind of thing, because it was again Edmonton was central. Um, uh, I don't remember anything about it anymore, or any of the people. I do remember uh, um, that there was a um, uh, like a little reception before we had dinner. I think of that and having a great time at that. I mean, we were, we're all have been busy meeting, actually talking to each other, what's going on in your place, and perhaps. Yeah acting a little foolish, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> well, that would have been funny to run into you, Michael, at those those events. <laughs> yes, um, yes. You, for you a while. Have. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think so. I think I would okay. have remembered you. But there was, they did have their own building for a while right on Ross Street, but then it just yep. became house parties after that. And, yeah. you know, it was my first experience being around other gay people. And I was so terrified of the women. I would just hang with the men all, all the time. <laughs> Thank goodness, some connection. of us knew that. <laughs> yeah. there, there was a connection between the, the bars, which were very hidden, and the house parties, because word oh, yeah. always went through where the house party was going to be held. And one of the things I think we lost in the, from those early days was the unity and the sense of cohesion and being uh, a single community. Absolutely. It was so underground, right? That we really maintained our yeah. connections. Yeah. yeah, it was. Any other comments or or questions or bits of memory, uh, Archie, yeah, welcome. I, I just recent, well, not recently, but I've been back in Edmonton for about the last four years, uh, living in the East before that in Ottawa. But I was at Club 70 in the first building and oh. I do remember it being dark at night down below and <laughs> lots of tables around. Um, you sort of felt like in a subterranean cave or something, but um, after it closed and moved to the other spot, I was spent many days with others painting those walls black, and that went on for some time. And then eventually, I, you know, I was just, uh, I was a late bloomer too, came out 27 uh, age, and um, 
that was my first really introduction to gay life here in Edmonton, even though I had been born here and been here up until uh, 1973. And uh, I was on the board, um, I believe for at least one year, I'm just not too sure. I knew Dow Hicks, Roy Wilson. I remember Willie uh, Millie. I can remember sitting in the Mayfair bar way towards the back with a big table of uh, a mixed table of uh, uh, men and women, gays and lesbian. And, um, you know, a few of the other watering holes too. So um, I have a little bit of the history in my background. And uh, I was really interested to hear more about the more recent things uh, because that all happened while I was away. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Archie, for sharing sharing that. I remember the the back of the Mayfair very very well. I, I think it's must be very the feeling of relief and almost exultation the first time. I entered a gay bar, which happened then to be the Royal George. Uh, but finding the thing, uh, you just, I suppose, I'm not sure that today, when it's, it's much more permissible, people can really understand the enormous relief and the fact of having found someone, followed a day later by, my God, what have I done? And the fear then uh, <laughs> that came in. Uh, a very different time. Yes, and 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 Archie, I remember those walls being all black in, yes. in there as well. I didn't, but I didn't realize that you were that it, that they hadn't been black when they moved it. That I was painted. Oh, oh no, we were for that. it. Yeah. Oh. And they also had uh, black lighting at some. Yes, they did. Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> And I remember I worked behind the bar, I worked behind the uh, entrance counter and uh, uh, various things. Yeah. It was a good time. Yeah. And it was all volunteers. That's right. Yeah. I did that. Do you remember, do you remember the roost and the, all the Barbies hanging upside down from the ceiling? Oh, yes. You know, and they were like, they had like, pins they look like masochistic and yes <laughs> i love that i took pictures of that i got special permission to go and take pictures of those oh. i have that photograph somewhere of all these barbies barbie dolls hanging upside down all tied up and you know you, being, uh, handcuffed the, and joan you should collect them at some point and and donate them to the city of sure. edmonton archives that's they got sure. a they, yeah, they got a lot of our stuff, and I keep encouraging people to do that. And that the archives are, uh, yeah. in, you know, fifty years from now, when people want to know and went on, yeah. most yeah. of us won't be there. So, <laughs> yeah, I have sent some things there already. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah, and I will yeah. continue for sure. Right. Great, Michael. There's certainly another whole talk to be given about the area about um, the era, the early era of AIDS and the way men and women came together then and the way in which yeah. the, uh, the community learned its power. I, I'd love to hear you talk on that uh, yeah, another yeah. time. Sometimes, sure. No. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, there's lots of history when you start that. Anyway, as we found out. If there are we're a little, we still have five minutes of time to our allotted uh, end, but if no one has any further questions or comments, Michael, I'll give you the last word um, and, uh, and then we will uh, we'll close. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, and I, I'm delighted to have the have the opportunity today. Encourage um, uh, uh, all of you to both, you know, look at the website because there's a lot there that, and a lot of it you would find interesting. But also, if if you know things or have things to contribute uh, that that are uh, in written and some kind of like written form or video or pic photos, and that um, um, the only way they're going to be saved is if they end up in, in archives. And so I encourage that. Um, and um, or you can do your own um, recording on, online these days and, and put it into the archives or into the history uh, history part as well. Um, 
because we're always looking to up not to, to, to continue to update it and to bring it forward and that and it and it means as i said at, at the beginning we're looking for real people with who were did real things in that real places and that they can talk about or put forward what what they actually remember it gives the context and i think that's one of the parts that's important in all of it are looking backwards and forwards is the context of how why this happened and that um uh and that so encourage that otherwise thank you i was delighted to do it thank you michael and uh it really was a, a first rate talk uh, and uh, thank you uh, uh, as well to my uh, colleagues for technical help and thank you to all of you for attending. I hope we'll see you again next week when the uh, speaker will be uh, uh, Macaulay Cassidy, who is a, a co-founder and uh, seniors program director for Cyber Seniors. She will talk about creating spaces for LGBTQ2S plus seniors in the virtual world. So I hope you will all attend. Uh, so with that, I will, uh, will uh, uh, Jan, you have a, uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> with that, we will, we will close. Goodbye all. Bye-bye. Peace. Bye everyone.